Hey, FitHeads, today we talk with Bob Messerschmidt, and holy crap, he's super smart, used to work at Apple, he's solving all of the world's health problems, I'm pretty sure. But let's get back to an important thing, you're inflamed, chances are you are inflamed. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get to this question till the end of the podcast, but I was like, wait a minute, how many people should be paying attention to how bad their inflammation is? And he's like, hmm, yeah, everyone, Every it's pretty much everyone's problem, and <laughs> And right now we think about it like I hear about inflammation, but there's no there's no way to know easily how much you have and then how to bring it down. So Bob is well, doing there's that. There's no common way, and there's no uh, cheap, yeah, common, effective, easy, frequent way to do this. I think because it's a general test. You know that what he's talking about the yes, sorry, the erythrocyte sedimentation rate. It's a blood test that shows general inflammation now it i think that one thing actually yeah, it's funny we didn't really you and i sort of talk about this a lot so i feel like we got caught a little bit in this so good thing we're doing this intro now <laughs> but inflammation in the body is a, is is an indicator that something else is going on right, right? and so now and a precursor to test. every disease he's like all of them heart disease, medical, like all sorts of disease. So inflammation is something you want to track because it tells you something bad's going on. And then you to play around with diet, exercise, you know, giving up Sleep. booze that God forbid. Well, but not giving up booze. That's what Ooh, we stay tuned. Is my head. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Total Fit Heads. Serious fitness for not so serious people. Bob, welcome. Thanks. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited to talk to you about how much I'm swelling. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Inflammation. Yeah, that's uh, that's my universe these days. It, it feels like just this nebulous term that is thrown at us that really I don't know what to do about except to get more inflamed because I'm stressed now about inflammation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, it, and it's that's a correct impression. Infl inflammation is uh, there are so many different pathways of inflammation, and there are various biomarkers to measure inflammation. Um, uh, but all biomarkers don't reflect all pathways, and there can be. Uh, I mean, there's there's a big difference between uh, chronic inflammation and acute inflammation. Inflammation is also one of those things, it can be good, right? So, uh, you know, as, as fitness people, you know this. I mean, the inflammation, uh, inflammatory processes are very important when you're uh, uh, recovering, uh, in recovery from uh, uh, bouts of exercise. Um, so we, um, but... Uh, you know, inflammatory processes probably underpin all chronic disease. So it's when, um, yeah, yeah, all chronic disease. Uh, I mean, uh, one of know, my the, questions uh, was, what does inflammation then lead to disease wise? And the answer is all. All. Yeah. I mean, everything. I mean, so the, the this is the current thinking and there, you know, it's, uh, um, I would say, uh, be skeptical of any research findings, you know, anywhere in in history, uh, you know, until they're well replicated and, um, you know, uh, they have some, uh, you know, multiple sources of validation. But um, uh, the inflammatory process is being seen broadly as uh, the underpinning of of all chronic disease um you know which which covers which crosses categories so cardiovascular uh you know the, the, everything that that is not acute like like uh, uh well i was going to say cancer although the the uh, they're finding that inflammation is actually underpinning even cancer um but uh chronic cardiovascular conditions um begin with inflammatory processes so you can imagine cardiovascular inflammation in and so i'm not a doctor i should get that disclaimer on uh, the record but 
um, inflammatory processes that occur in your cardiovascular system, that's what leads to plaques. That's what causes plaque formation. And so that's what eventually clogs arteries and leads to strokes and heart attacks. Um, my, my brother is a heart surgeon, so he knows, uh, uh, he knows very well, uh, you know, that uh, by performing coronary artery bypass graft surgeries on thousands of people over his career, you know, it's this clogging of arteries that, uh, uh, you know, begins, begins with an inflammatory process. Um, and also metabolic diseases. So, uh, uh, the the biggest of which is of course across population wise, which would be type two diabetes, um, is not type one because that's that's something completely different. But type two um, begins with uh, inflammatory processes, probably resulting from you know a sedentary lifestyle and from eating too many bad things. So there are lots of foods which are identified now as inflammatory, uh, sugar, you know, being the obvious culprit in, in many cases, but, uh, you know, people talk about various types of vegetable oils also, um, runs the gamut. The good news is, because I'm an optimist, um, and I've improved my health, uh, tremendously over the past several years, uh, by uh, um, paying attention to these things. Um, but there are anti-inflammatory foods and strategies, lifestyle strategies also. So just as there are inflammatory lifestyles, there are anti-inflammatory lifestyles. And so I can delve into that a lot more. Uh, uh, key, key to knowing whether anything is working, because I think this is, I, I, I imagine you folks agree with this. Um, uh, not everybody is getting the same benefit from the same strategies. Um, so when we talk about lifestyle interventions, there are some things that are going to work for me that are not going to work for you. So, um, I mean, that's, that's true with, with, uh, um, Medica you know, medical interventions also, you know, there, there are some drug strategies that work really well for some people and not well for other people. So there, there's often a process of trying to segment and uh, classify individuals based on what their response is going to be to a particular medical strategy. We need the same thing in lifestyle strategies. So we need to know what people are going to respond well to or that they did respond well to. So it would be better if you could know ahead of time. But, uh, you know, uh, at, at least we can know if we can, if we can collect good um, real-time data, uh, we can know what you did respond to. And so that's really what I'm all about uh, these days is giving personal feedback, personal information to people that can tell them whether strategies that they're doing are working for them or not working for them. And so inflammation was a logical place to start. So we've we've built this uh, this little device, oops, it disappeared, there it is, uh, um, that uh, uh, you can take a little blood sample and put it in a cartridge like this, just a, it's a little capillary tube and you can stick it in our reader device and you can um, 30 minutes later have a medical, uh, a, a diagnostic number uh, called erythrocyte sedimentation rate. Um, and you can then go about various lifestyle intervention strategies and see whether you can uh, lower your sedimentation rate. It's really a, um, don't mean to prattle on here, but it's <laughs> it's a way of thinking to put these lifestyle strategies into the hands of individuals is really thinking that uh, my career goes way back, but it's that type of thinking of, personalization and putting the power in the hands of individuals 
goes back to my time at Apple. And when I first met Steve Jobs, um, that was his, that's his mantra was the iPhone especially was going to become a game, game changer in terms of giving people enough bandwidth, enough computing power and enough screen real estate bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera, in your pocket to be able to feel a feeling of self-efficacy over the, you know, we're, we're all empowered, right? We, we all, you know, we're all, uh, there are a lot of people out there in the world and in the country who do not at all feel empowered to take control of their health. Um, they have to, they have to, they feel they have to cede that authority to some degree to an establishment, a healthcare provider, um, nothing against healthcare providers, but if you do not feel like you have agency over your own health, and uh, I, I view this as one important way to give people that agency is to is to give them the data right on their phone and and let them see changes that they're making and how they have an effect. So, uh, you know, the uh, uh, in in human psychology, this is this is just called, uh, you know, self-efficacy. Um, and, um, you yeah, know, so. Steve Jobs believed that the iPhone was going to be the magical device to allow that to happen. And maybe it did, but that was 2007 and it's been, it's <laughs> been pretty slow. <laughs> so this is not, this is not an overnight thing uh, to, you know, to cause these societal changes, but that's kind of the mission that I'm on. Wow. Um, first cool. of all, this is a podcast and the point is the prattle on. So thank you for doing so. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I've, I found my home. <laughs> exactly what we needed. Oh, Max, you were going to say something? Uh, I mean, I think you said you said whole whole mouthful there, but uh, well, why don't we just start at the beginning? How did you start working with Steve Jobs? Well, I I cold emailed him uh, back in uh, 2008. Steve um, at apple.com. Well, I actually did. I did I did I I uh, cold emailed to steve at apple.com because I figured I I was just guessing his email address. It was just pretty well cloaked. You can't really find it. And um it could have ended right there. So I I had a company Back then in 2008, it was called Rare Light, and we had developed some technology which will remain nameless, or the technology will remain undescribed. But uh, I felt that Steve would be, in, Steve and Apple would be interested in this technology, and we were looking to raise capital. So, you know, I was pretty dumb at the time, still am, but uh, <laughs> I think. I I thought uh, Apple was you know they were venture investors you know or sh should be anyway I thought and but they don't really invest you know they they acquire um, small companies and anyway so that's what happened so I I I, I reached out to uh, Steve Jobs at Steve at Apple dot com and it could have ended there but I got an email back about a week later and it said I'm probably not the Steve that you're trying to reach. <laughs> that's all it said. So it was some other guy at Apple named Steve. Some yeah. poor, unfortunate guy at Apple. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm sure 30% of his job is just like, nope, not wrong guy. Sorry. Wrong guy. <laughs> that yeah. email was an autoresponder. <laughs> well, and funnily enough, uh, when I joined Apple, uh, they gave me some ridiculous Apple email address, like, uh, Bob Messerschmidt 20397 at apple.com. And I said, uh, I, I called up IT and I said, um, you know, don't, what about Bob M at apple.com? Do you have that by any chance? And they said, well, you know, that's funny because that is available. Yeah. And uh, I said, okay, <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> and I became, I became Bob M yeah. at apple.com. 
So and they're like, we changed the policy around naming after we got a call from Steve Jobs. Or- <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm sorry, I'm I'm down a rabbit hole here, but but uh, uh, so I became Bob M at Apple.com. It turns out that that email was recently given up by a guy named Bob Mansfield, who was the head of hardware. He was he's he Bob Mansfield was a senior VP of hardware at Apple. Uh, still there, he was still there at the time, but he gave up the email address. I'm not exactly sure why, but I I basically got his email address, <laughs> and you know, so he was a senior VP at Apple, right? So I could all all of the junk email that I got at that account was like, uh, "Are you interested in a new Learjet?" Because, uh, you know, we have uh, we have a G2 available that just came on the market that you might be interested in, or, you know, perhaps a vacation home, a second vacation home in Hualalai or, you know, so, so I just got the greatest spam email at that at that Bob M at Apple dot com account. But yeah, so let, let me climb out of this. So eventually, hole. Steve, eventually, Steve Jobs. Did you ever get in touch with Steve Jobs? Jobs? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, um, the uh, I, I got this email back from Steve at Apple dot com, and uh, so I said, okay, well, I'll guess again. I'll try again. So it's probably S Jobs at Apple dot com, and uh, sent sent it to that email address, and it didn't bounce. And uh, about a week later, on a Saturday morning, um, sitting at my computer, and an email comes in that says, uh, "Can I call you?" And uh, um, I, you know, I yelled to my wife uh, in the next room and said, uh, "Hey, Steve Jobs just emailed me," and she said, "Yeah, sure, right." <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so I, I hastily typed in my my uh, phone number, and it rang about thirty seconds later. And I was talking to Steve Jobs, and uh, so this was this was two thousand eight, um, and the uh, so the the iPhone came out in two thousand seven, and uh, t- by two thousand eight. Uh, there was there was already an Apple Store, if you remember. This is this is all ancient history now, right? Because we don't remember a time before there was an Apple App Store. Um, but there in, was there in, was Fire, and then there was an Apple Store. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's about it. that's that's correct. The wheel yeah. was somewhere in there. The wheel. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, something. <laughs> uh, so the original Apple Store or the the app. The apps on your phone were was it was a closed ecosystem. You couldn't you if you couldn't as a developer write an app and put it in an app store. Uh, but iOS 3.0 was the first version of of Apple iOS that had a uh, a developer app store. And uh, by, by the way, the all the apps were priced at like a dollar or two dollars or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> times have changed. Um, but anyway, uh, Steve, who we called SJ, everybody at Apple calls him SJ, not Steve. Uh, SJ was, uh, was looking for technologies to acquire and, uh, basically help build out apps and technologies on the app store. And, um, so we talked and, uh, he was indeed very interested in the technology that I had uh, been working on, uh, but he thought it was too early. He was he was very interested in things that he could go to the worldwide developer conference the next week and say, "Okay, we've partnered with this company, and uh, you know this is this is what they have, et cetera, et cetera." So it was too early, but we continued the conversation about uh, our tech, my technology, and how it might benefit from being part of the Apple ecosystem. And about a year later, after multiple conversations, I got another call from Steve Jobs and he said, uh, uh, yeah, we'd like, the only way this makes sense for us is if we own it. Um, And so uh, just uh, think about it for the weekend and call me back and tell me how much you want for it. (laughs) 
So, um, so I did, and and uh, we came to a deal, and uh, you know, so then I joined Apple, and I became a director, not a not a VP uh, or a senior VP, but I became a director at Apple, <laughs> uh, uh, which uh, uh, was still pretty rare air. So there were only there were, at that time in 2009 there were only a total of 500 people at the VP and director level director and higher so those that was 500 people at apple and there was there was there was a, an even more rarefied group called the top 100 at apple which was just the vps vps and higher there were 100 vps uh, but there were 500 total vps and directors and uh, so I was an Apple director at uh, in a group called Platform Architecture. Um, I was, I think, three reports away from Steve Jobs. So my boss was a guy named uh, Mike Colbert, who has uh, unfortunately also passed away, just like Steve has passed away, SJ has passed away, but... Mike Colbert was a great guy, uh, right hand man of of uh, Steve Jobs, and uh, um, he reported to the previous mentioned Bob Mansfield in the hardware organization, and then of course Bob Mansfield reported to Steve Jobs. So I had a very short reporting line um, and. You know, I I think I would have probably interacted with SJ a lot more over the next uh, two years, except he got sick again. Um, he had already had at the time that that uh, my company got acquired by Apple. Um, SJ had already had um, pancreatic cancer and um, had. Um, had had his first procedure for that, you know, to have, uh, actually, actually it had two procedures. He had had probably, you know, probably a Whipple, which is where they, uh, remove part of your pancreas. And then, and then he subsequently had a uh, liver transplant. Um, and, uh, so that, at, at the time that, uh, that I started working at Apple, he he had already had the liver transplant, but that did not work. I think you'll you know you, if you are a student of Apple history, you'll you'll remember that uh, that did not it had you know it had already gone beyond that doing any good. Um, so um, so yeah, I became a platform architect. So what what is a platform architect? You might ask. Um, so, <laughs> um, so at, at Apple, it's, it's kind of like platform architecture is one of the, it's a technical team of people and they can be named, they can have any, you know, name people just kind of name their, their small tech groups, whatever they want. And there's, um, there's, I don't know, maybe a hundred such groups collectively think Think of them as like Google at Google X, so it's like the uh, the sort of ideation teams at Apple are dispersed, and there's usually a um, you know a, a group leader, and then they have a small team of of people working with them. So that's what that's what I had at Apple, um, reporting into Mike Colbert and Mike Colbert. Uh, had a bunch of other reports who had similar teams of people uh, with who were sector experts. So my sector expertise uh, is in optics and spectroscopy, um, which um, that's why I'm speaking to you from the George Eastman Museum here in <laughs> lovely Rochester, New York. No, I actually am not in Rochester, but... Um, so um the uh you know my my career has largely been um revolved around uh measuring things using light so i've i've 
I, my, my, my training is actually in biochemistry. So I'm interested in solving biochemistry problems using optics and spectroscopy. That's kind of what I've done my, my whole career. And that's what I did at Apple. I, you know, and uh, having come into Apple the way that I came into Apple, um, you know, through Steve Jobs, essentially having Apple acquire my company, I could really get read in on any project that I wanted to be read in on. And uh, so there was this interesting project starting. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not talking about the, the technology that they acquired from me because it still has not shown up in any product. So it's still, you know, they, they still, although there, there are probably a hundred people still working on it at Apple, it's t- tantalizingly. <laughs> um, but um, uh, the, d- during that time, there were, there were other uh, projects spinning up that, you know, people wanted my involvement on so in one of those projects was the was the apple watch so that was that was a project at the time uh that you know that could have led to a product and did did end up leading to a product a lot of them don't you know a lot of them are dead ends you know just like any sort of ideation early stage ideation stuff but the apple watch project had a shine to it um because of the people who were involved it was really being led by the design studio and johnny ive who you know who who ran the design studio and was a close confidant of of steve jobs um and steve steve had a you know, he had personally blessed the project, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, uh, they they wanted to read me in on that project. And I said, yeah, yeah, sure. I'd love to. And um, so, you know, what could I do? So uh, I was interested in the health tech side. The, the Apple Watch was at that time, the project was kind of schizophrenic uh, because there were people there who thought everybody, there were, there were people who wanted a watch product that said Apple on it, right? Um, but there were there were two competing groups. One said, this is really a communication device to augment your iPhone, right? And provide, you know, glimpses of information that are easily accessible on your wrist. And then there was another group of people at Apple who said, um, you know, this there's an opportunity here to make this a health tracker and let's, let's, let's load a bunch of sensors into it. And, uh, you know, those two groups of people, I wouldn't say it was mortal combat, but it was. (laughs) 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 There was was some tension. And uh, so I was all in on the digital health uh, camp, obviously. And uh, I said, well, I'll tell you what I can do. I can uh, I can show proof of concept on a bunch of different sensors that we could put on somebody's writ- wrist. And, uh, you know, I can show first light, you know, of, you know, these sensors providing real-time data. And, uh, you know, maybe they'll, that'll get some more people excited about it. So uh, in my team, we ended up uh, probably getting, you know, the, the first glimpse of... Uh, uh, PPG, which is photoplethysmography, which is, you know, as an optical sensor that measures heart rate or, or you know, pulse, pulsatile signal in the tissue. It's not really an electrical heart rate. It's a, uh, it's an optical heart rate measurement. Just looking at, at the, the, uh, pulsatile arteries, uh, the, pul- the pulsatile vessels in the body and, you know, looking for, boluses of blood passing by the sensor ppg that's called um you know you're probably wearing three or four ppg sensors right so everybody is there's there's um uh yeah you got your aura aura ring if you have one of those uh, that's one in there right there you go there you go nice um (laughs) whoop a whoop band has the that none of that existed at the time. There was a uh, there was a Fitbit. The Fitbit 
back in 2009 and 2010 didn't have optical sensors. It was really a, uh, it was a 3D accelerometer tracker. I was watching you walk. Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't on the wrist either. It was on the, uh, it was a clip, clippy shaped thing that you clipped onto the, you know, your jeans pocket or whatever. And then there were some people who tried, they had another idea for form factor to uh, strap it to the laces of your, of your, uh, Mm -hmm. of your running shoes, which would obviously give you better sort of, sort of step information, but nobody liked the form, you know, the user experience of that was kind of wonky. So that didn't happen, but anyway, so, so the sensors that we architected and showed first light, uh, PPG, EKG, so the electrical sensors, uh, we showed te- a temperature sensor, um, SPO2, uh, you know, pulse oximetry sensor, um, and a few, uh, I can, you know, I mentioned those because those all exist in the product now. Um, uh, and there were, I think, four others that are not announced in the watch yet. So they're still in the pipeline. So that maybe they'll pop someday. <laughs> I'm assuming this is an NDA situation and you can't reveal on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's. I don't know whether I'm covered by any NDA or not. I, I probably am, but it's more a matter of why, why ruin the surprise? like that yeah (laughs) (laughs) so um that the uh um uh the all of those so so that did that that uh you know that that part of the project got green lighted because of the work of uh not just my certainly not just me (laughs) and certainly not even just my team there were there are multiple tiger teams around Apple working on various pieces of it. Apple's like an organism um, that self assembles, <laughs> sometimes for good and sometimes for evil. But anyway, <laughs> I digress. Uh, so so uh, you know those sensors became. So I, I was in. I ended up having twice weekly meetings in the design studio with. Uh, um johnny ive who was very gracious and uh you know treated me like a human even though he had no reason to because he didn't know me um but um you know invited me into the inner sanctum and you know we i think we did some cool stuff so that was that was very rewarding um and you know, it's also nice to have played a key role in a you know something that generates billions of dollars of sales every year. So. <laughs> cool. it's crazy! How anyway, cool. did I answer your question? I'm not sure, or was there a question? <laughs> oh yeah, it seems like it. Okay, so now you've moved your focus to this specifically inflammation tracking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I've, I've, you know, did a few other things after Apple. Um, I had this is this is the second startup post Apple. I've, I've been involved. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've been involved in multiple startups. I have had, I guess, three successful exits. So that's kind of cool. Out of I don't know, five or six that that I've been involved in. So it's pretty good. Uh, um batting average yeah, what <laughs> <laughs> um but the the previous one we 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 uh we, we did something very complex which turned out to be you know um have pretty good user traction but it was very it was priced very high for the market and uh you know i you know i i love having this conversation directly with consumers but there's a real honest to god price limitation for what people are willing to pay to get this information which we might all agree is critical to people but there's a real dilemma of how to get it to people at a at a consumer price point so 
that was a bit too idealistic that that project that that company had really great venture capital backing we uh, had raised um 12 million dollars um over the course of uh three years from people like coastal ventures and founders fund um and uh you know so those those interactions were very rewarding um but you know we um we in the end did not get there i'm not uh you know i'm not beyond admitting that um the uh so this this is this is a sort of a new start um and you know i started thinking about how do we how do we do something um involving so i i believe that if you're gonna get information to people blood is an obvious place to look right because that's if if you look on the diagnostic side on the medical diagnostic side your doctor is able to get all kinds of information that that allow him to create a coherent picture of your health and some of that is vital signs and looking at you and you know using the little hammer thing on your knee and <laughs> you know <laughs> you know asking you about your pain and your uh so forth and so on but a very large percentage of the information your doctor has and an, and an increasing share of that information is is laboratory medicine right so just all these can they're going to take 12 tubes of blood from your arm and they're going to tell you whether you're you know what what's if, if anything interesting is going on and uh six something like uh 60 to 80 percent of all medical decisions today or 70 or 70 to 80 percent of all medical decisions are largely based on the blood diagnostics so blood is blood is where it's at so if you want to know what's going on in your body uh you know and you don't like getting blood taken that's you know that's a tough situation because you really need <laughs> and i don't like i don't like blood being taken um but um you know so i'm i'm interested in in things that we can do that uh, make that experience of getting a blood sample easier simpler more consumer friendly um and i became infatuated and obsessed quite frankly with the idea of inflammation being the the underpinning of of everything that's going on both bad and good <laughs> uh in your body um and i was able to use myself as a bit of an experiment um uh, and i've i've struggled with weight my whole career you you two are super fit i'm not super fit um uh but i'm a lot fitter than i was 5 years ago um and um the uh um so i've i've struggled with weight my my whole life um i mean very much struggled with with weight um but uh and so i and so by by looking at inflammation so weight is you know excess weight on your body is highly inflammatory so my i and, and so whenever i had my blood work done my esr my erythrocyte sedimentation rate was super high and the the doctor would look at it and say well you know yeah it's high but you know um you seem pretty healthy you know because i'm a I, I suppose i don't know uh i'd say i'm i have a strong constitution right i don't get sick a lot i um you know i'm i i'm yeah i'm strong and uh you know the doctor would say well don't worry about it too much yeah your inflammation number is high but you know it's probably fine <clears throat> um but you know i was really not satisfied with that so anyway i i decided that as i got older 
um, you know, and the excess weight started becoming more of a burden to me. It was really never a burden, um, but uh, it became so. And so I decided to lose weight. And as I started to lose weight, my erythrocyte sedimentation rate started to drop precipitously. Um, and, uh, you know, I never got to the point where I was pre-di- pre-diabetic. You know, you hear that a lot, you know, as, as people get older, they become, uh, their hemoglobin A1C goes up and their um, fasting blood glucose goes up. Um, I never got to that point, but my inflammation was high. So I was, I was concerned. And then I started reading about inflammation and, you know, why it, it underpins everything, including diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And, um, so, uh, my, uh, my ESR value was in the forties, which is, you know, it's, it's a meaningless number to you, but, uh, you, you the, um, <clears throat> okay, I'm, I'm going to go down another rabbit hole. So um, ESR is allowed to drift up with age. So uh, it's one of the one of the few sort of blood diag. Well, uh, there, there are a number. I won't say few, but they're, they they uh, they the the allowable level of ESR changes with age. So I was, you know, I've got a few years on me. I was allowed to have an ESR of 30 being, you know, being uh, 50 plus, let's just say. And uh, uh, so I, as a male, so it, if I were female, it could even be higher. Um, the, the f- a 50 year old female is allowed to be even higher, like I think 40 or something like that. And so that, you know, as a scientist, I thought, well, that's weird, right? I mean, the, the male-female difference, that's more understandable to me as a scientist. But uh, the age thing, I thought, well, that's really weird. You know, so and th- so the way the, way the, uh, the population normal is arrived at, you know, in, in medicine is you take a, a population of people. So let's say everyone, right? Something that represents everyone. And you measure the the blood biomarker that you have this magic technology that can measure something. You know, it's what CRP is another one uh, uh, for inflammation, and ESR is ESR and CRP are highly overlapped. They they give largely the same information. Um, but um, but but yeah, but ESR is unique in that uh, CR, CRP can does increase with age, but not as much as ESR does. And um, so went to the literature and it turns out that if you, so, so the, the population normal increases with age, but is that because there's some, you're, you really do have more inflammation as you get older and that's okay and expected, right? Yeah. You know right, where I'm going. The population. <laughs> so yeah, so the population, it turns out, is just getting sicker and sicker and sicker as they get older and they more inflamed, more inflamed, more inflamed. And if you do a study where you say, okay, let's take really super fit people of all ages. And now let's look for age dependence in that data set. It doesn't exist. There is no age dependence of ESR in a uh, you know in a super fit uh, cohort. Um, so that's really interesting to me. That that's what really got me sold on on trying to do an in home ESR measurement because there are all these people running around in the world who have elevated ESR, uh, which means there's a lot of people I can help. That's point number one, and point number two is that uh, there's the ESR measurement itself has a lot of headroom in it. So I, you know, there, if somebody is at 30, I can, you know, there's a lot of headroom in that number. Whereas uh, in a marker that, that is not, does not have such an age dependency, you might have less headroom for, for improvement. And you might in fact be running into the, uh, sensitivity limits of the tech of the technique like high sensitivity crp 
has a floor to it of maybe 0.4 migs per liter. Um, some 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 of the assays can get down to 0.2 mix per liter, but um, you know there's very little headroom for improvement down at that level. ESR, on the other hand, there's more room for improvement, and they're both reflecting the same thing. They're both reflecting numerous inflammatory pathways in your body, not exactly the same, but highly overlapped. If anything, ESR is reflecting more inflammatory pathways then is CRP or HSCRP, either, either one. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's a good marker. I can also bring it to you, the, the consumer, at a very low price point. And, um, you know, that is, you know, that's, that's something that, as I referenced before, my learning from my past startup is this, this has to be, you know, at a really real consumer price point. Um, and so, you know, losing, losing weight got me down to, uh, I don't know whether you, if either of you has measured your ESR, but I'm sure it's spectacular. Um, <laughs> the, maybe not, maybe not. Well, we should, my I don't know. high sensitivity CRP was really high. It was. And it's continu con continually high, but it was interesting that you brought up that fit people have it lower. I feel like I'm inflamed because of my workouts. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just so it's um, um, uh, if it if there's a baseline that's high, yeah, that could that could uh, indeed be. That um, uh, I would I would say, looking at the literature, there's there's some evidence that you still you still don't want to be that inflamed, right? So there's okay. maybe find the thing in your workout regimen that is really causing the inflammation, right? What segment of it is it? Is it more large muscle work, which is possible, right? If you're breaking down a large, a lot of large muscle through uh, weightlifting, um, that can that can increase in inflammation numbers, and maybe uh, I don't know. Maybe I like I'm not again not a doctor, <laughs> but you know maybe maybe you would want to cut back on that. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, ESR ESR would be it would be interesting for you to look at also, um, and uh, now you can. Yeah. <laughs> so you got yours down via the weight loss, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for bringing me back on track. Yeah, um, the uh, uh, so I got down to um, a number that I was you know. A lot of people would be comfortable with a number of eight, which I I got from 40 to eight millimeters per hour just through weight loss. Um, and that's pretty good. And a lot of people would be happy with that, but I was not happy with that. So I wanted to then look at, at anti-inflammatory food options. So I'm very big on food is medicine. Uh, the the concept and I cook and I and I I love food and I love cooking and so I wanted to find the things that were anti-inflammatory for me and um, so tart cherries um, you know it turns out um, was the main strategy I used to go from eight to three so my my sedimentation rate is now three. Did you use juice, the actual cherries, or those pills? The juice. So they're just the there's a um you can buy it at Ralph's. Um it's a tart tart cherry juice. Um and just about four ounces of that in a you know, on some ice uh at, at night. It's also it's a tonic that helps uh, with sleep also. So if you have sleep problems. Four ounces of tart cherry juice at night, you'll sleep like a baby. 
Nice. Add me to the regimen. There you go. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, so I don't then, know about the pills, but but they they're probably fine too. So if I'm testing on your core device and then I do a shot of cherry juice and then test again, like how long do you have to sort of stick to an intervention before then you'll see a change? Yeah, yeah. So we 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 think, and based on my experience uh, and other early users, weekly is going to be enough. So the weekly check-ins with the with the core finger stick is going to be plenty. So you you should think about self experimentation, kind of on a weekly or two weekly base uh, two week basis. You do something for a couple weeks and then and then see the effect of that um in the in the at the end of that period um esr does not change instantly it's not as so uh, one of the reasons crp is if you're if you're in the diagnostics field if you're doing medical diagnostics crp these days is preferred to esr uh, because it's it's quicker uh, it responds more quickly. So if you're looking to find an infection uh, as a as a as a root, as something that's going on in, in infections cause inflammation. So if you're trying to diagnose something, you might you might look at at CRP. But for these self experiments, um, the uh, ESR is going to be highly overlapped with uh, with CRP. Um, and yeah, so it's 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 not an intraday thing like continuous glucose monitors. You can see response from your uh, lifestyle interventions within day, intraday. Uh, you won't see that with ESR or CRP for that matter, but you will see you will see responses week to week. And you are happy with your three now and it, it really was like no other <laughs> diet intervention you just started drinking that juice yeah juice there uh, there are some other dietary interventions that i've uh, done also nothing was as responsive as the cherry juice was so i um there were, are other uh well-known anti-inflammatory strategies um uh, i get plenty of uh, omegas I eat fish and I use olive oil and I eat walnuts. All of those things have omegas um, and omegas are highly anti-inflammatory. Um, so that, that was probably my number two strategy was walnuts. Mm -hmm. When you were losing weight, were you glucose monitoring as well? Did that have something to do with it? I did not actually, because I've never had I've never had high fasting glucose numbers, so I didn't I didn't monitor myself. Got it. Probably should have, but I didn't. Um, you mentioned that this inflammation thing was a good place to start. Do you uh, do you have plans for what's coming after? Yes, um, you know th this is this is a big enough thing to bite off for now. I, I, I'm a little gun shy, you know. I, I bit off too much with the last, you know, sort of effort. I want to I want to get this, uh, you know, up and running and um, going well before I look at other things that we can do in house. But yes, I am in general a believer in bringing this sort of information from blood uh to people in their homes so yeah i would i would like to build off of it absolutely um i'm not sure i can really say where i would go next i mean i i i, I do like cgms um and i like wearables i mean the vast majority of my career actually was spent in completely non-invasive things you know that you could measure optically and transdermally um sending a beam of light into you know your arm and then collecting that information back out um so i like i like those things also um but um 
you know, maybe uh, something that might be of interest to you as uh, as athletes, um, we can uh, we can use a, a, a. I wouldn't say it's not the same technology as we're using with ESR, but we can. I I know of a good way to measure lactate, for example. So you could you could measure lactate in a finger stick, maybe the same finger stick as we're doing the ESR with. Um, we might be able to measure hematocrit um, using using a similar technology. So there are, there are things like that. We're going to be very selective and pick things that fit the business model, right? Which is that these have to be really, really inexpensive things and that they don't complicate the user experience significantly. I mean... Requiring a drop of blood is a is a user experience complication. You know, let's be honest. Uh, you'd love to be able to do things completely non invasively, but i i have to I have to say that that is at least for now essential to have at least one tiny drop of blood. That's that's a requirement. But have you found people have an aversion to finger pricks? Is it common? It's not common, but it is there. So, uh, kind of that's a really good question because our the 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 person who led our two investment rounds at our last uh, last startup uh, has a blood aversion and just would never use this product that he was investing in. He would never use himself. And they, you know, <laughs> He'll give you money, not blood. <laughs> you know, yeah, really. You don't think of that in, you know, the, the, mostly in the VC community, you, people are investing in things that they themselves see, that they see themselves using, but not, not in this case. <laughs> um, that was, uh, he probably wouldn't mind me dropping his name, uh, Keith Raboy, uh, was our lead investor. And uh, he was at Coastal Ventures when he invested uh, initially. Um, and it was really, it was, it was Keith and it was Vinod Kosla himself who were, uh, who were the, the main, you know, sort of thrust of that investment. And in fact, after, <clears throat> after Keith left Coastal Ventures to go to Founders Fund, um, the, uh, I got a call close to midnight one night, I think this might've been an hour or two before midnight, but anyway, the phone lights up and it says Vinod Kosla on it. So, you know, of course I answer it and, uh, you know, it's just, uh, you, you probably have, have, uh, founders, startup people in your audience, in your podcast audience and, I would recommend this group of people to anyone in a heartbeat. So to have a guy like, like Vinod call up, you know, one of his portfolio companies, you know, at 11 o'clock at night and say, uh, you know, yeah. So you probably saw the leaked news that Keith Raboy is leaving Postal Ventures. And, uh, you know, it, it got leaked and, uh, you know, so I'm, I wanted to call you up and say, we have you, we got you. And it was, it was really I who was the instigator of why we invested in your company. And, uh, and I got your back and, uh, you know, I wasn't even that worried, <laughs> honestly, but, <laughs> uh, but but uh, you know, to have a to have him call up like that, I mean, that's what every founder dreams of, right? And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then oh, and then Keith invested again in founders with founders fund. So so yeah. anyway, so we we had we had a rock star team, and um, we didn't get there. But you know that often happens. So uh, don't have any regrets about doing what we were doing. And we might come back to those ideas someday. Who knows? Right. It happens more often than your batting average, for sure. Yes. Yes, exactly <laughs> right. Great. Yeah, it's, like, it's something <laughs> like it, it, they say 90% fail, but it's probably right. more like 99. 
Yeah, and then that one's the unicorn. It turns out you're a unicorn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would say, though, of companies that get to Series A and get to a Series A with a top-tier VC. So there's there's three tiers of VCs out there. But, you know, KV is a top-tier VC. And to get to a Series A with them, your success rate is pretty good at that point. <laughs> You, you know, right. but you know, but it's it's not it's not assured. It's maybe, you know, it's still your chances of of having a really great exit at that point is you know maybe is up to like ten percent. <laughs> <laughs> this so, is a hard life. The startup life is is a is a is really it's really rough out there. It's it's never great. You keep you doing know. it serially. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're getting something out of it. You must. Yeah, I mean, you get you get the endorphins, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's my it's it's my long distance running. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so so uh, uh, yeah, so I don't know how I got onto that, but uh, they. Um, um, the, the the there was there was really good backing and uh this this new company is really is really bootstrapped um um you know we don't have vc backing with the new company we do have some vcs on our cap table but they're you know they're not like lead investors or anything um and uh, uh, this is, you know, a, a bit of a grassroots bootstrapping effort. It's like it's like Johnny Cash and Merle Haggard singing and singing about hitting the road and uh, you know getting on a box car and you know headed off and just surviving in the wilderness for a few years. That's, uh, you know, that's the quest that I'm on at the, at the moment. I love it. How poetic. <laughs> I'll sing right, you the well, lyrics. Well, I'll sing you the song, but you, you probably don't want me to do that. It would, it would <laughs> ask your readership. readership. Oh, that's great. So there's one thing that we didn't touch on that how common is this chronic inflammation? Like how many people really do need your product? Or maybe I guess you did mention like the size of a market. I'm I'm thinking like I think it's how many in ten people should actually be. Yeah, I, I I think um I think that the the numbers are staggering, right? It's like almost everyone. Right, everyone is wow. uh, could be doing a better job of controlling inflammation, and you know, if only you had some way of measuring it in your home, you know, very it. inexpensively. <laughs> if only uh, you could, uh, you could really do a better job. And you have to look at, you have to convince yourself. And we're going to provide um, content information that will help you see why. Uh, so many people feel that you should really lower your, your inflammation. Um, and, you know, I, I, again, I've said this three times already, but I am a scientist. And so I want to see that longitudinal data, right? And I want to see that, you know, a well-designed, randomized clinical trial um, testing in any inflammatory strategies versus not, right? You know, I want to see that um you know that there is an impact on morbidity and mortality um and so and there and there is and there is a tremendous impact so yeah i think it's i think uh you should not be satisfied with the medically allowable levels of inflammation in your body you should want them to be lower um and uh, that's that's the mission it's yeah it's largely everyone uh, but the people who are really feeling it 
So the the uh, you know so we have a lot of data now because we've have we have a waiting list for the product that you can go to our website uh, the core dot uh, sorry corehealth.com c o r health.com and you can sign up for a waiting list for when we're shipping in December. Sorry, that's a bit of a commercial. Um, <laughs> but um, you can, we're, we, we, we ask people some questions, you know, what they hope to get out of this product and so forth and what their demographics are. The people who are really struggling are the older, somewhat older demographic. Um, the uh, 35 to 49, yes, but 50 plus years old. Uh, people are feeling the effects of inflammation. You, you might be able, you might be strong enough, like I was in my younger days, days to not even really feel it. Um, but uh, by the time you're forty-nine or fifty, you're feeling it, and and so those those are where our waiting list is uh, is a, a bit of an older demographic, and that surprised me. It shouldn't have surprised me, but it but it did. Um, and, um, so, um, it, it's, it would be, it, and it's, I think we have an obligation to inform more of the younger crowd that thinks that we call them young invincibles. Uh, we have a duty to inform those people that if their inflammation is high, they could be doing more, um, to so how do, how do you get somebody in their 20s to be interested in longevity i feel great yeah. i don't care blah, blah, blah. exactly okay. yeah yeah so but they should be right because you can see the but esr that we're using might be the the world's best single longevity metric right it, it actually is a biological clock in and of itself right it can wow. tell you whether you're older than you, than your years, right? Which mm. wiser than your years, that's a good thing, but older than your years, yeah. you know, that's not a, that's <laughs> not a good thing. And that. so it's uh, because of this age dependence, right? It's a really good marker for uh, as, as a biological clock. There are, there are many biological clocks out there, you know, that use DNA, telomeres, um, various metabolite data points, et cetera, multifaceted markers that are, you know, very highly validated and and good. I'm saying if you wanted a single marker, you you can use you can use ESR that way. Interesting. Yeah. And as you're collecting this data data on people, <laughs> are you aiming to make those those kind of segments that you were talking about that where this type of population sort of responds this way and, and you're this yeah. type of person. So you're yes. aiming to get there. And yeah. how many segments are you seeing? Is that is that even something that you can answer right now? It's it's not that each person is actually an individual. It's that we can kind of group them. Sort of uh, phenotypes of individuals. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, there are. There's the, but and there I would say it's stratified in the way that you would expect. It's uh lifestyle is it sedentary is it active um and then within each of those phenotypes um there's a spectrum of of inflammation and then there are there and then there are also people who have food sensitivities that's another big thing um that are these tend to be autoimmune things going on in the gut and so that there are a lot of people struggling with uh, weed allergies and gluten allergies, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so that's that's a big population of people who are who have who have higher than expected inflammation. Um, and um, environmental sensitivities um, is another is another category. Um, There, there are even uh, there. There are things that can affect inflammation that are um, not food or fitness. There are there's stress, right? So there are stress 
related things that can that can drive up inflammation. Um, so I would I would say that we can stratify in in all those different dimensions. Right. I did I did see that you were a, a winemaker. Is that true? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I do. So I did. Yeah. You're able to fit alcohol within your anti-inflammation strategy. We have some good data on that, uh, actually. So uh, uh, one or two drinks a day uh, of, you know, something that has, you know, the the good tannins, the anti, um, the uh, uh, flavonoids and so forth um, can lower inflammation with one or two drinks a day. So That's I know awesome. the day, the jury is still out. Like if you, yeah. so uh, if you, if you look at the, the, the RCTs don't all agree on this. There are some that say that complete abstinence from alcohol is actually better for you as a reduction, a strategy to reduce morbidity and mortality. Um, but then other studies show that one or two drinks a day is actually better for you than completely abstaining. Um, and then the the study no study is perfect so you can't you can't ever look at one study and everybody wants to do this right everybody wants to say oh there's this new paper out and it shows this <laughs> you should never do that <laughs> <laughs> um you have to look at the sort of totality of evidence um and uh but but in my data you know i can talk about my data it does appear like like you want to have a little bit of wine in your life, a little bit of red wine. And uh, my my red wine is not commercially available, but I chose to make predominantly Pinot Noir because Pinot Noir ha as a grape has the highest level of resveratrol of any of the, of any of the, at least of the French grapes. There are some other Eastern European grapes that have even higher higher levels of resveratrol, which is which is a uh, anti-inflammatory compound. That's crazy. Cool. To drink Pinot Noir, if you if you want to <laughs> That's drink. That's it. You heard it here, Fitheads. <laughs> and it, uh... chase it with some walnuts. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for chatting with us. This has been awesome. And no, this was great. It was great. I go ahead. Oh, um, yeah. I'm just saying the fit heads can go sign up for your wait list. What was the website again? Yes, uh, corehealth.com. There's no e, so it's c o r health.com, and you'll see it. That's right on that landing page, top level landing page. You'll see a link to sign up for the waiting list, and uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, we're we expect to be shipping in December. That's awesome. Right when Christmas. everybody's ready to get back on their health journey in January. Yeah, you know, all the health clubs are filling up, etc. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> yeah. Well, thank you again. This is super awesome. Really cool to see what you're doing and I'm excited for what's after the inflammation as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was a pleasure. And thank you to the Fitheads. If you can rate and review on Apple Podcasts, that helps us out a whole lot. And we'll see you next week.